I'm not sure how to answer that question, except like, like this. The Bible says, he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. God, even, even if the Bible says in Timothy, Paul says, even if we are not faithful, yet God remains faithful. I got into a long discussion with someone this week. Uh, their thing was that if a person sins, if a person keeps on sinning after they're saved, they're probably not saved. Which I replied to that, and I, I would say this about anybody in this room. There is no one in this room who has quit sinning. Right. We still sin. There, the Bible makes a very clear... You do? Yes, we do. The Bible makes it very clear, John, the Bible makes it very clear that there is an old man and there's an old nature on the inside. And the Bible makes it very clear that when we get saved, there is a, a new creation on the inside. So that we there's this constant struggle between the old nature and the new nature. The Bible says to us that in Hebrews 12, it's either wherefore, therefore, Therefore, seeing we are compassed about the so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the sin and the weights which doth so easily beset us. The uh, Bible says in 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins, now John's writing, John's a Christian, so it's evidently addressed to Christians. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us to wash us from our unrighteousness. Now, there are people who say, well, that's talking about being saved. Unless you believe in sinless perfection, you, 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 have, to, you have to agree that people still do. John Wesley, who was a, a, a mover in the, the Methodist movement, kind of believed in that and he said this, if you think things like envy or jealousy or things like, of that nature are sins, he said, you can do that. He said, but I, don't, I, I choose not to believe that they are sins. Bitterness. The, the, the problem is that, that we look at salvation from a, a saw from a human perspective in that we say, well, if I was God, and, and people were doing that, I, I would reject them. You see, that, that does not take into the account the mercy of God. Jesus came into the world to save sinners and the mercy of God. We've said this before. How many sins did Jesus pay for when he died on the cross? All of them. He paid for all the sins of the world. John the Baptist made it very clear. Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins. I think it says sins. Maybe it says sin. Maybe uh, corporately. But taketh away the sin of the world. And he is the propitiation for our sin. He is the payment, the atonement for our sin. But not for our sin only, but for the sin of the whole world. World, yes, John. All right, last week you happened to mention that somebody <coughs> that you were having a conversation with said that uh, it was only the sins up to that point. Right, right. So it wasn't for the sins of everybody that lived beyond uh, Jesus and and what he did on the cross. So it was just up to that point. Um, I, I've been contemplating that for the past week, and I'm okay. So I, I, so I know, yeah, I know that uh, what I believe, but what that do you does, believe? but that does uh, um, uh, leave a question mark. Okay, so what's the question? The question I'm not sure is what the question was, but are, did what Jesus did on the cross pay for the sins? of all those who were 
Are you asking what and about us? Future. Are you asking about us? Yeah. About 2,000 years, yeah. Okay. I'm only asking, John, I don't want you to be uh, explicit about it, but did you commit a sin yesterday? Okay, yes. And so, uh, so that sin is past. So it's past. That sin is past. See, Jesus, I, I, I know what you're asking. And what you're saying is this. It's kind of like the Seventh-day Adventist. The Seventh-day Adventist believe that I, I believe the year was 1870-some. They believe that in 1870-some, Ellen G. White had this vision that Christ left the right hand of God and moved into the temple of God and in heaven, and that no one up to that point, they were saved conditionally. Now, after that, everybody is saved. Of course, they're... they're they keep the law, they're law keepers, they really don't believe in salvation by grace like we do. But the, the, I understand your point. However, did Judas go out and hang himself? Okay. And the Bible says this then, what thou doest, what do thou likewise? So should you go out and hang yourself? Well, of course not. And look at Mark for a minute. I'll, maybe this will help you. Look at Mark chapter 16. Look at Mark chapter 16. If I can get there. Last chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Hang on one, one second. I got it. Mark 16, Jesus said in verse 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now that's the good news. We're to go and tell people that Jesus died for our sin. Christ paid for all the sins on the, uh, of all the world, John. Let's just make that one clear. Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world. That idea in that verse, that, he, and, and that one verse, just one verse, it says that he paid, that he died for the sins, for the remission of sins that are past. Well, he also died for the sins of the future, but people took, take that one verse and they make it appear that he only died for past sins and not future sins. Just that one verse. Now look at verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, the Church of Christ, take verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. They say that you have to believe and be baptized to be saved. If you don't get baptized, you're not saved. Now, there's just that verse, and then there's Acts 4.32 that says repent and be baptized for the remission of sin. But they take those two verses and build an entire doctrine of that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Well, we know that's not true because the second part of that verse says, he that believeth not. It just says, he that believeth not. So if we believe, we're saved. But now notice the next verse. And there these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, they shall take up serpents. Now, there's really no other verse in the Bible that says anything about snake handling. Now, there is a verse where Paul got bit by a snake and he didn't die. But here's the only verse in the Bible that we find about handling rattlesnakes. If we had a basket of rattlesnakes up here this morning, I say, John, do you have faith today, my brother? I want you to go in there and stick your hand in there and pick up one of those snakes. Now, there are people that believe that. I just read a couple weeks ago about a guy that got bit by one and died in, from handling it in church. 
He, and he must not have had faith. That, that's just it right there. If you have enough faith, John, notice what else it says. It says you'll be able to uh, um, serpents, and if they drink any, any deadly thing. Now, I don't see many churches having uh, arsenic drinking services or strychnine drinking services. Yet there are people who take that one verse, one part of that verse, and say, well, if you got faith and if you're saved, you should be able to handle deadly serpents. Now, look, so to take one verse, okay, like that verse in John, or Romans 3, 24, where he died for the remission of sins that are past, and to try and build an entire Bible doctrine and say that he only died for the sins up to that point, when we know that the, the, the what's the word I'm, I'm looking for, the, the, the to all of Scripture points to the fact that Jesus paid all the sins of the world. He paid for every sin that you and I have ever committed. And, and, and here's the thing, he paid for them. So we, we come to this question that we've often answered, what is the sin that keeps a person out of heaven? Unbelief. Look, if you would, at John chapter, I think it's 16. John chapter 16, yes it is. John chapter 16. Listen, people do not miss heaven. If I can say it like this. People do not miss heaven because they smoke and drink and chew and cheat and lie and steal. That's not why they miss heaven. They, they miss heaven because they do not believe. Look at John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. The Comforter, of course, is the Holy Spirit. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Verse 9. Of sin. What sin? because they believe not on me. Now, when, if a person dies without believing on Christ, look at Revelation, Revelation chapter 21, Revelation 21 and verse 8. Revelation 21 and verse 8. A person does not miss heaven because they're sinners. Now, now in a sense, that's true, they do but they miss heaven because they've never believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. John, John 3.16, everybody knows John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on the Son Verse 18, is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. If a person, and they could not, if a person could keep all the Ten Commandments, which they can't, we know that's impossible. They still couldn't go to heaven. Why? Because they've never believed and they're already condemned. Why are they condemned? Because they've not believed in the name, on the name of the Son of God. That's why in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, it says to believers, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. We are not condemned any longer. Now, notice though in 21 and verse 8, uh, verse 7, he that overcometh. Again, we've said in 1 John 5, 7, Who is he that overcometh? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Christ. Those people who have believed on the name of the Son of God are overcomers. That's what we are. To him that overcometh will I grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We who have overcome, we who have been saved, we who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb, we're not condemned. I'll never stand before him and be condemned. 
That's why I've said, when you and I die and go to heaven, you say, when I die and go to heaven, I got a heap of sins that No. They were paid for at Calvary. Now, I, I said this. If people die without Christ, it's, it's not that they smoke and drink and steal and do all that stuff. Look, I, I understand that, and I hope you understand that. But what sends them to hell is that they have never believed on the name of the Son of God. By that we mean this. They have never appropriated to themselves. They've, they've never called whosoever shall call, Lord, and I've heard people say this, well, there's no such thing as a sinner's prayer. Well, there is. Uh, the, the publican said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said that guy went down justified. Peter yelled out, Lord, save me. Look, I realize there's no, okay, pray this prayer. Lord, I understand I'm a sinner, and I know that I'm not going to heaven, and I want to go to heaven. Lord, I ask you to forgive me. I say, and some people say, well, there's this uh, a typed out prayer. No, no, there's not. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Say, one second, Mike, let me read this, and then I'll answer your question. Verse 8. A person may die and not go to heaven because they have not believed on the name of the Son of God. But when they wind up in the lake of fire, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, people pay for their sins in hell. I mean, they'll, they'll pay for them. Uh, those who have rejected Christ, the Bible seems to indicate in Hebrews of how much sore punishment shall they be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God and count the blood of the covenant or the sanctified and the holy thing. So it's not people's sins that send them to hell, which they'll pay for in hell, but it is the fact that they have never believed on the name of the Son of God. Bonnie? Bob, I was trying to figure out an answer to his question, too, is that in 1 Peter, when it talks like verses 3 through 5 or 6, but with, you what know, chapter are you in? First, first chapter. Oh, 1 Peter, Peter chapter, chapter one. 1. Okay. Right. First Peter 1, verses 3 and 5. 3 through 5. Yeah, or 6, even. Okay. Um, says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, his abundant mercy, for the Lord is merciful. The Lord, the Lord is of great compassion. That's what God is. Which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have, we, we have been born again. You're in the same chapter. Notice down at verse 22. Seeing ye have purified yourselves in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Again, we spoke last Sunday about the effectual fervent, passionate prayer. So we are to love the brethren fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So that according to what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. There's something different on the inside. We didn't turn over a new leaf. I see, I see people argue that all the time. Well, you know, now that we're saved, we've got to do better. If we don't do better, then we're not saved. You know, I, I don't understand their logic on that because I could never... Now, I think we ought to do better. But I'm back there in first time. I, I believe that we ought to do better. We ought to walk worthy of the vocation. Shall we continue in sin, Paul says that grace may abound, God forbid. 
how shall that we are dead to sin live any longer therein? And I understand people's objection. They say, well, a person gets saved and then they still sin. How, and, they're going to, and God's going to be really mad at them. Well, Ken? I think the biggest problem with people is we like to categorize sin. Yeah. You know, there's no difference between Adolf Hitler, Jeffrey Dahmer, and a little kid that's told not to steal a cookie out of a cookie jar. All their sin is sin in God's eyes, no matter what it is. You know, and in first John when John the Baptist said this is behold the Lamb of God that take away the sin, it's not plural, it's it's singular. Okay. You know, and the Pharisees and Sadducees, when they wanted Christ crucified, it's because they didn't believe who he was. Right. And the thief on the cross that said to remember him when he went into his kingdom, he believed who he was. So there's two and different two different thought processes there. One believed, one different, didn't right. he? And it's one sin that keeps us out of heaven. It's belief. The devil wants us to doubt constantly our salvation. Oh, absolutely. He, it's his number one thing. Well, absolutely. You, you've done this, you've done that, you've done this. If you don't believe, you're not in. And, and so, let me finish reading what Bonnie gave us in verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. It's reserved. Somebody says, well, can you cancel the reservation? Well, you might cancel it down at the Chinese restaurant, but the Bible says that it is reserved in heaven who are kept by the power of God. Not the power of Jim, but the power of God. Through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. So... The question is, does willful sin cause me to lose my salvation? And the answer to that question is, absolutely not. In my opinion, and this is my opinion, you can take it for whatever it's worth, I think almost all sin is willful. How many say, well, what do you mean by that? Okay. To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not. How many have ever, ever, ever been impressed to do something and you didn't do it? Ryan, thank you. Okay, we got two, three, four, five. Yeah, we got luck people. If you're really honest, and the Bible says this. Here's what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. Two things. It says One, don't grieve the Holy Spirit and don't quench the Holy Spirit. Grieving the Holy Spirit means to do something that the Holy Spirit has impressed upon you not to do. Okay? And I'll raise my hand. I've done things since I've been saved. The Holy Spirit, now you ought not do that. You ought not do that. And I did it. Quenching the Spirit is not doing something that the Holy Spirit has impressed you to do. Like, you know, the Holy Spirit impressed you to, I'll just say, give, give $20 to the missionary. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. Now, wait a minute. We grieve and we quench the Holy Spirit. But I go back to Romans 8, 1 again. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. We are not condemned. Does that mean we don't sin? Of course not. I reject the idea that people think that, that we never sin after we're saved. Of course we do. But Jesus paid for those sins. That is the mercy of God. That is what we, we do not deserve, God's mercy. Ken said something. I, would, I agree with him, but, you know, a little kid stealing a cookie, probably not quite as bad as Hitler, but, but... A sin is a sin. He's right about that. I mean, of course he's right about that. Ryan, do you want to say something? No, I was fixing your hair. Oh, fixing your hair, okay. I had my glasses on, I couldn't see. But anyway, so it's like we, 
we get tangled up in our philosophy and say, well, you know what, if I was God, and this is the devil, because I remind you that the devil puts wrong thoughts, wrong desires, and causes us to do wrong actions. The, the devil, our enemy, does that. Wrong thoughts. Well, you, I, I, I cannot tell you how many times as a young Christian, Satan put in my mind, you can't be saved because you committed a sin. Well, wait a minute. If I could live a perfect life, I wouldn't need Jesus. And I will just say this to you. I, I do not say this proudly, or I cannot tell you how many times as a young Christian, Satan impressed upon me that you cannot be saved because you committed a sin. And so I would pray and say, Lord, Lord, I, I so desperately want to be saved. And the devil would constantly, as Ken said, and it's true, that Satan constantly wants to get us to doubt whether or not we are saved. And the, the, the glad truth is, I, if I could pour this open your brain and pour this in, I would, that he that believeth on the Son is not condemned. Are there Christians who we wish wouldn't do some of the things they do? Yes. But does that mean they're not saved because they don't do the same thing I do? Of course it doesn't mean they're not saved. So that the, the answer to the question, well, what if I commit willful sin? Will God reject me? No. He may chastise you. I, I think, and I've said this, I believe that much chastisement is the Holy Spirit works on us. Have you ever done anything that you knew was wrong and then the next thing you know, man, God's beating you up over time about what you did? Yes, that's exactly what it is. It's not punishment, it's discipline. Uh, I've said before, I'll, it's the only illustration I'll use about me, is that before I was saved, I, I, I wrote this to the guy I was talking to. Look, man, I knew words the devil didn't even know. And after I got saved, I tried using them once or twice. And I'm telling you that the conviction that I never... Do you think it bothered me before I was saved? No, it never bothered me. I could have cared less. But then I got saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ according to his abundant mercy, whereby he hath begotten us into a lively or a living hope. I tried using those language. And, and God, literally, the Holy Spirit, I, I can remember this. It's like I'm there playing today uh, in a game uh, in high school, and I can remember swearing out on the field. And I can remember God literally hit me over the head with a two-by-four. I said, man, you ought not do that. Now, did I quit that day? No. It took a while. You say, well, are you sinlessly perfect? What do you think? That's um, what I thought. Yeah. Am I? No, of course not. You say, preach. And, and this person asked, if... They, they said, well, Hebrews 12 again in verse 1. Lay aside the sin which doth so easily beset us. People say this. I've asked God to forgive me of the same sin a hundred times. Will God forgive me a hundred and one times? If you ask that question, you really don't understand the grace of God. And I mean that kindly and sincerely. If, if you think that the mercy and the grace of God wear out, but wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He paid for all that sin. Now, I'm not saying shall we continue in sin that grace may abound. And I understand that people object. Well, Baptists think that once saved, always saved. Well, of course they do. And they say, well, Baptists think that if you're saved, you can go out and live any way you want. I've never said that. I do not believe that. 
But if you think that the preacher's perfect, you better think twice. Am I working on stuff? Every day I'm working on stuff. Some of it's the same stuff over and over and over. Have there been things in my life that I've gotten victory over? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't talk like I used to. I don't do that. Somebody says, well, preacher, I have a problem with that. Well, a lot of people do. Uh, there, there are things that I used to do that I don't do. But there are things that I still find myself doing, and I get disgusted with myself. I asked the Lord again this morning to forgive me of something I've asked a thousand times. But God knoweth our frame. It is but dust. He knows that we are prone to sin, but that, my dear beloved brethren, is the mercy of God. Should we continue to sin? Of course not. Are we working on it? Of course we are. Paul said in, in Philippians, I guess it's chapter 2 or 3, he said, I pressed toward the mark for the prize. But he says this, I have not yet attained it. Even the apostle Paul said, I haven't gotten there yet. And so we, as believers, are, and I've said this, there is uh, what I call positional holiness. The Bible says, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 13, I believe, without holiness. And I, when I read that verse, oh, man, I'm doomed. I, 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 man, I, I can never measure up. You're right, you can't. Positional holiness means that I am declared righteous in the sight of God, and as it says in 1 Peter, I have a reservation made for me in heaven. That is, that is positional holiness. Practical holiness says that I'm not there yet, and I'm working on it, I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to improve by the power of God. I'm trying to do better. Have I gotten there? Nope. And I won't until I get to heaven. I'll never be free from sin until I get to heaven. But if you're using that as a benchmark to say, well, I, I, I still sin. I don't guess I'm going to heaven. You really, truly don't understand the grace of God and how great God's grace is, and how merciful God is. And instead of causing us to say, well, I'm saved, and I'm always saved, and I can go out and live the way I want, when we stop to think about the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God, that ought to compel us, as Paul said, for the love of God constrains me. And so... Why am I trying to do better? Could I go out and live it up? Well, I could. I could. But do I want to? No. Why? Because somebody loved me more than I could ever have known. So why? Why? What I want the purpose of. Now, do I? Yeah. I fail more than I, I want to. But I'm not condemned. I'll not have to give an answer. Re remember, brethren, this. And if you have anything you want to say, I'll accept. There's the new creation, and then there's this body of flesh. I remind you, 1 John chapter 3, that which is born again. That which is born of God, being born again, as Peter says, begotten of God. That which is born of God, that new creation, does not sin. Neither can it sin. But this old flesh, I mean, it, in the flesh dwells no good thing. So there's this struggle between that new creation of God on the inside and the old, and the old man. Uh, that just 
wants to. And so Paul said, I die daily. I die to myself. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Look, we're, we're pressing. As a church, we're moving. We're pressing toward the goal. Now, are some climbing the mountain faster than others? Yes. Are some farther along than the preacher? Yes. Are some farther along than you? Yes. Are some back farther than you? Yes. But we're pressing on. We're moving on. We're trying to, by the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, to do better. That's what we're, we're trying. Now, that is practical holiness. Positional holiness, I am holy, therefore I shall see God. Positionally, Ephesians chapter 1. Practically, boy, I'm still working on it. I'm still trying to attain. I never will. We're not doing it alone. Huh? We're not doing it alone. We have indwelling. That's exactly right, Dave. We're, whereas before I was powerless, now the indwelling Holy Spirit gives me the power. Somebody, I, I, I'll try to remember how it said, I'm not what I am going to be. I'm not what I'm going to be. But thank God I'm not what I once was. Uh, I, I'm not there, and neither are you. But, you know, when I look at you, you this morning, I, I see a bunch of, I'll say it kindly, I see a bunch of people who are failures. But by the grace of God, because of God's wonderful grace, we're moving, we're moving on. Do I fail? Yeah. Forgetting those things which are behind Forgetting. Bonnie? Um, I think the way I understand it, and Brent probably kind of told me how to understand it, is that if you, if you think that you can lose your salvation because of sin, okay, then you have not put your 100% faith and trust in what Jesus did on the cross to take you to heaven. But what happens is that doesn't affect our salvation. It affects our relationship with God. So just like a child who's born into a family, no matter what happens with that family or whatever, you are, you're born into that family. Absolutely. We're born into his family. But if you don't obey these kids, this is kind of a Bible club thing, if you don't obey your parents, it doesn't affect the fact that you're their child. It affects your relationship with your parent. So it's like that's the way it is with us. And like Dave said, we don't even have, our flesh does not have the capability of even, to like like myself, I, like to die to self daily. I don't even have the power to do that. I have to put that, that like the Holy Spirit, that resurrection power, say, God, I can't do it. You have to do it for me. But I'm willing to be willing to die. <laughs> that, that, are you willing to be willing to die? Here's something she said. If you believe that you can lose your salvation, here's what you think of Christ. Now, you may not say it. You may not say it this way. But it is, I believe the death of Christ was necessary, but I do not believe that it was sufficient to cover all my sins. Therefore, it's like a lot of people around here. They believe that the death of Christ, but now I've got to live a good life in order to go to heaven now that I'm saved. Well, wait a minute. If I could live a good life, I wouldn't need to be saved. But that is the power of God. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. So to everyone that believeth, it is the power of God. Not to everyone that believeth and is baptized, or to everyone that believeth and lives a good life, 
or everyone that believes and belongs to a church, or everyone that believes and has perfect Sunday school attendance. It is the power of God to everyone that believes. Isn't that, very, isn't that simple? That's just pretty simple. I mean, that's just... Uh, Ford Porter wrote that track years ago, God's Simple Plan of Salvation. And that's what it, it is. Now, I don't minimize, and I don't, I try not to minimize that a person needs to understand things about salvation. They've got to understand they're sinners. And that's why Jesus came, died on the cross to pay for our sins. That's why he came, in the mercy of God. Anybody got a thought? Anybody want to say anything? I know that we've hit this, but somebody wrote a question and asked me about it, so I thought I would try to answer it. Today, it is the power of God. I know that, I'll say this and we'll be through, I know that as a young Christian, look at Hebrews for a minute, chapter 10. Hebrews 10. And verse... 23, Hebrews 10 and verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. That's what we should have. We should love one another. As Peter said, we should love each other fervently. That's what we should do. All right, now verse 25 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. I've said this about my son's church. They have, they've quit Sunday night and Wednesday night. They, they have Sunday morning. Now they have study groups where people meet in houses and they talk about Sunday morning sermon. And it's like Ben said, well, I can see that last in a while, but anyway... Uh, not forsaking, but exhorting one another. So much more as you see the day approaching. I ought to exhort you. And stay at it. Be not weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Don't give up. I know people. I do know people. That's what they did. They said, well, I just, I can't do it. And they quit. I can't do it. Verse 26. When I was, as a young Christian, I saw it. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the flesh, the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. I said, uh-oh. Uh-oh. Boy. And I, I took that as a, young, as a young Christian. Well, that means you can lose your salvation. No, that isn't what that verse says at all. It says, for if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. There is no other sacrifice. That's the, Jesus, Jesus is the only sacrifice. Even if we sin willfully, there's still no other sacrifice for sin but the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Look back at chapter 6. Here, here's a couple verses that people like to use. They like 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18. We don't have time. We're done. We're finished. Cakes are done. People are finished. Chapter 6 says this, uh, Peter says, or Paul says, whoever wrote it, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on. All right, so now that we're saved, let's leave our salvation experience, not forget it, but let's leave it, and let's move on, let's grow in grace. Verse 2 of the doctrine of baptism, of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment, and this we will do if God Permit. Now verse 4, 5, and 6. Oh, for people who believe you can lose your salvation, these verses are the it verses. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put into an open shame. People like to use these verses. They say, see, it is possible to lose your salvation. But I, I, was, I say this, if that is true, then it is impossible to be saved a second time. 
Because it says it is not possible. If they should fall away to renew them again into repentance. You couldn't be saved a second time. Every person I know that believes in losing your salvation believes you can be saved again. Now, I'll say this. We've got to stop. It's 25 after. I'll say this. Now, I do know, but I'll just say this. I may not know what these verses mean, but I can tell you what they don't mean. They don't mean, they do not mean, if, I can say, if I'm saying that right, they do not mean, these verses do not mean you can lose your salvation because I've got too many verses that says that it's impossible. And really it says in those verses right there as I was reading it, for it is impossible for those who are once enlightened. And it tastes the good. It's impossible. Then it says if they shall fall away. Oh, fall away. For them to be saved again. I, I can tell you this. It does not mean you can lose your salvation. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man shall pluck them out of my Father's hand. So, do we sin willfully? Yes. Does God reject me? No. Am I still saved? Yes. May God... Discipline me? Yes. He may. He very well may. And if he does, be listening. Okay? All right. Father, thank you again for your great mercy, for your great love wherein you loved us. Lord, we thank you that our sins are gone. As far as the east is from the west, you've put our sins away. Lord, we thank you for that today. Father, we pray again. Uh, Lord, there's so much wrong stuff. But Lord, help us to rightly divide the word of truth. To take the Bible for what it says. Lord, again, I thank you for this good day. Thank you for my brothers and sisters who are here. Pray for those who couldn't come. But Lord, here we are. Lord, we sure do need a blessing today. Father, again, thank you for our Sunday school hour. Thank you for your great mercy, your great compassion. The fact that you are slow to anger. Lord, we thank you for that today. Lord, bless, we pray, as the hour continues now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.